welcome back everyone, it's me Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. We're talking about indirect fire today, and particularly mortars, and of course many of you may have already checked out my video of me visiting Sweden or BAE Systems Haglunds, where I was able to work with the CV90 Mark IV platform. Go check out the video, it's a lot of fun, but it really gave me a huge insight to the CV90 platforms that are available, and one of them is the CV90 Mjolnir, otherwise known as Thor's Hammer, and quite the name for this vehicle. Now I've also done a video on the AIM uh, mortar system which is an advanced twin mortar tube system which is really really cool but it's quite expensive uh, and the Mjolnir is somewhat of a compromise between having that high rate fast mobility uh, indirect fire support system for 120 millimeter indirect rounds but with the compromise of not being super expensive like the Amos. The Amos being a almost direct fire capability 120mm round and indirect fire with autoloader. The Mjolnir is a little bit different. It still requires people to put rounds into the breech uh, and it's loaded automatically into the tube uh, by the arms, by the troops inside as well. So really, really cool bit of kit. And I want to review it a little bit because I think this is truly the future of mortars of today. We have a lot of base plate mortars. The infantry obviously use mortars inherently in their operational deployments and their trade because mortars are able to give a huge amount of indirect fire at a high angle. And as an artillery gunner myself on light guns, uh, mortars can do things that sometimes light guns cannot do, especially when it comes to, you know, um, weight of fire and the amount of ammunition that can be carried in a 120 millimeter configuration. When we start looking at, uh, you know, 105 millimeter guns, two part ammunition, ammunition, it gets heavy and the logistics increase. Now I want to be really clear, I don't have specific bias to the uh, BA Systems, Mjolnir and Amos platforms. I actually just genuinely think, in terms of practicality, they're an incredible piece of equipment for indirect fire. Now there are other vehicles, other platforms out there that have very similar capabilities and uh, I guess overall basis of indirect fire with mortars. But what I love about the Amos and particularly the Mjolnir is the fact that it uses a relied upon and very, very experienced platform such as CV. 90 to get it where it needs to be. Mobility is key when we're talking about shoot and scoot maneuvers and shoot and scoot is the future of indirect fire. The old school way of setting up mortar pits and you know digging in and holding ground is definitely still there but the future really is that artillery positions, indirect fire and mortars or light guns or any kind of artillery configuration needs to be able to move once it's fired because counter battery artillery fire as of today and we're seeing it in the Ukrainian conflict is very paramount. We're seeing that, you know, once rounds start going down range, it's very quick to pinpoint and accurately locate artillery batteries with drones, aerial surveillance and return fire very very quickly and if you have something that is able to set up quickly and traverse terrain fast and get out of that location again to then set up another position elsewhere you're reducing the risk of that battery being engaged the great thing with Mjolnir is that the turret can actually be taken off the vehicle and integrated into something else. So if you wanted to put an Amos turret onto the CB9 feet platform or the Mjolnir turret, they can integrate into one another either on a wheeled or tracked armored vehicle. This allows battle groups to select the CB90 platform as a standard and then modify what they require if necessary for their indirect fire capabilities. It doesn't mean that you want to maybe not spend all of your financial budget for defense on the Amos, which is a more expensive variant of the indirect 120 20 meter mortar provided by BA Systems Haglunds, but maybe you want to do a combination of two, right? A battery of Amos that is a lot more quickly able to engage and also have the capability for direct firing, whereas the Mjolnir is more sort of the heavier strength mortar, I guess, batteries in the background that you'll be able to spend a little bit more money on more capability. The number of rounds that these vehicles carry is quite fascinating. And in fact, uh, the 120 meter round being so large and able to explode in such a dispersal rate that really hurts infantry, this is the infantry's best friend having these vehicles tracking behind. Now it really comes down to simple math with artillery, whether it be it being its projectiles being fired or the capabilities and logistics to fire it. The Mjolnir uses two 120mm muzzle loaded mortars. The mortars are loaded using a mechanical system, though loading is only partially automated and involves manual labour inside. This still allows the loaders to operate under armour protection, which if counter battery artillery fire is being fired upon them, the shrapnel is not going to engage them or take them out from being able to put rounds down range, which unfortunately is the biggest risk when it comes to working with mortars or mortar pits with the infantry is they are totally exposed to counter battery artillery fire, drones and aerial attack. It's the rate of firepower that's really interesting about this vehicle, 16 rounds per minute with a rate of sustained fire of 6 rounds per minute. 
Now, if you do the total tally of ammunition that these vehicles can carry, it's 104 mortar rounds per vehicle, which is a total of 56 rounds stored in the turret bustle and another 48 stored inside the hull. So 104 mortar shells, normally in a battery of three to four vehicles, you're looking at 400 rounds being able to be fired at 16 rounds per minute. If you were to put a fire mission of that much firepower in 120mm configuration onto a position and have the ability for that battery to relocate within less than one minute, think of the capabilities you have there for suppression. Now, many of you are probably, well, what about its range, Matt? What can it do for its range? There's no point having this thing if it can be engaged quickly from an armored force that may flank it or find it in its configuration. Doesn't matter how fast you want to travel, they may be able to shoot and scoot around you. Well, this is true, and that's one of the difficulties of having mortars is they do not have the extended range, potentially, of the longer guns, such as the M777 or 155 mm or 105 mm projectiles. However, the 120mm mortar still has the ability to have precision guided and extended range ammunition. Standard ammunition or standard shells from the 120mm Mueller dual dual tube is nine kilometers, right? And that's pretty substantial. I mean, the 105mm gun I use, the C3, maximum range about 11.5 kilometers. So not too far from a two-part ammunition howitzer, okay? It's still able to reach out to pretty long distances. It can also be given extended range shells that go to a maximum of 13 kilometers, and the Strix guide ammunition does have a shorter range of about 5 kilometers. But overall, considering the amount of rounds you have on board of this thing, it is a huge game changer for giving indirect fire support to light battle groups that require fast and agile artillery support, and not the more long term heavy duty support such as, you know, HIMARS, M777s, the bigger calibers. This is really giving a lot of flexibility to the battle group to suppress targets while infantry battle groups, infantry fighting vehicles such as the CV-90 able to interject and find those targets once they've been battered to pieces. The number of ammunition though that these things can carry really speaks a huge amount to this. Mortars are digested in logistics quickly, uh, especially in an infantry configuration. We've seen many times uh, infantry troops, you know, lugging in the ammunition as much as they can, and the logistics of mortars is difficult. Infantry can carry enough of it to get them by, but for sustained fire, it's just not going to do it. The mortars in dual configuration can be elevated up to about 85 degrees, which gives that really nice high angle into depression or into sort of gullies or sort of uh, in-depth positions really, really well. And the turret is actually able to only be limited to about 60 degrees for traverse, which isn't a huge amount. You know, you'd expect more of a 360 degree, but at the end of the day, due to its mobility, you're just going to neutral turn into a position wherever you need to fire. Now, of course, the Mueller does come from BA system Huglands, more specifically a Swedish requirement uh, and a contract of about 40 of them was signed in 2016, and the Swedish military commenced them through 2019 and 2020. Um, the Swedish designation, here we go, here we go, folks. Grenadtagskampanslegvangvagen 90. Oh, my sweet lord. I don't even know if I said that right. So I'm just going to say it in its abbreviated form. The GRKPBV 90. <laughs> I tried. I tried. Um, yeah, it's incredibly useful for the Swedish military in my, in my eyes. Uh, again, for the Swedish terrain that I've seen, uh, lots of sort of um, forest land um, can get really cold and, and snowy, of course, being in Sweden. Uh, the mobility of the CV-90 works just perfectly for the Swedish military. A small, agile force that has a massive amount of flexibility that can work alongside the rest of the CV-90 platform that is obviously a native uh, production vehicle brand for Sweden, so really, really good. Um, the Swedish military ordered two AMOS systems also with the CV-90 system, uh, but there were no further orders. And the Mjolnir was really the other attempt to create that close support weapon with rapid fire rate. And I truly do feel like, you know, for myself as a Canadian, I think the Amos or the Mjolnir would be a fantastic accompany uh, sort of infantry support, indirect fire capability for Canada for sure, or across the globe. Um, the protection, though, is not as much as I would have expected on something like this. It is able to resist against artillery shell splinters, um, but in terms of actual armoured-piercing projectiles being fired at it, normally only 762 by 39 millimeter projectiles can be stopped by the external armour of this vehicle. But again, the great thing with CB-90 and its overall configurations is it's modular, so you can add more stuff on there if you need to. I do want to emphasize, though, this is purely the Mjolnir turret, not the chassis. The hull itself is welded steel armour configuration. 
collaboration, which I've seen firsthand being produced. Really good welds, by the way. Beautifully constructed Swedish precision quality for sure. Um, but that is able to stop a multitude of rounds, including the 14.5 millimeter armor piercing rounds and blasts of up to 10 kilograms of TNT. Furthermore, you know, you can add on those ceramic armor kits. So, you know, it is the turret that's a little bit more exposed. So it would require that extra armor and that extra, uh, you know, protection. But overall, it's not going to be engaged primarily by, you know, peer to peer armor it's going to be engaged normally from counter battery artillery and that's what you want right you want this to be able to take a good slamming from some you know proximity rounds that could be fired back at it if they were detected from counter battery detection systems um it does have a very quick reaction and redeployment time normally it takes less than two minutes to open fire and less than one minute to lead the firing position which is extremely fast the brief reaction and redeployment times become very important today as i mentioned before especially when artillery radars and counter battery are used and i what i really really like about this vehicle is that in small groups they can cause absolute havoc if you have a network of mjolnirs that are just all over the place they're going to provide sustained long-term engagements of up to 104 rounds per vehicle at targets at close to 9 to 10 kilometers or potentially even further they are just a nightmare for infantry battle groups or mechanized battle groups trying to advance with a vehicle like this and the amount of firepower that it has available to it with that 120 millimeter round you're not going to have a good day and these can really sort of scoot around the flanks and provide a ton of support uh, especially if you're trying to get a force like a quick reaction force or qrf uh, to you know dive into a headstrong battle group that's got some gaps in the sort of in the lines maybe uh, this is able to suppress as troops sort of flow through those lines and really really capable um, artillery support now what i will say with the mjolnir is it's interesting how there's not as much interest in it i.e people are not buying it and i think a lot of that comes down to um they haven't realized its potential yet. I personally do feel that the infantry, although cheaper to maximize mortars, um, really don't get the same benefit that this has. And I don't think enough nations, countries, have really invested into the short-range mortar systems as much as other countries have, like Sweden, um, because they just don't have the same... I guess context you know the united states military have been doing a lot of research with their hummers um i've done some videos on their platforms including the hawkeye which is a sort of uh, uh a sort of a 105 millimeter gun on the back of a humvee um there's been other configurations of american hummers having you know the 120 millimeter mortars on the back that are also very very quick at being able to deploy and resupply and sort of use that sort of flanking indirect fire capability but what I'm trying to sort of emphasize with the Mjolnir is that that relied upon chassis, the CV-90 chassis, is giving a huge capability for that off-roading mobility that, say, the Humvee may not have or wheeled vehicles may not have. There's always a compromise, right? Do we want something that's fast and agile to go across terrain uh, that's pretty gnarly, muddy, snowy, etc.? Or do we want something that can redeploy quickly, be rearmed quickly, logistically, on a uh, MSR, a main supply route? such as a wheeled vehicle that isn't really going into the bush or in going into the, the thick of it, and it doesn't need that amount of required armor that, say, a tracked vehicle like Amos or, or Mjolnir will have, there's a compromise there. And I don't think that compromise has been really required by many nations yet, but I'm looking at you know, a lot of reports and scenarios and stories of artillery occurring in places like Ukraine right now, and I truly do feel like Mjolnir is going to start coming a lot more into the forefront of nations that may require that stopgap between short range, you know, 81 millimeter mortars with the infantry, even potentially 120s, to the heavier caliber. And this agile, quick reaction artillery, I think, is very, very useful. And I'm hoping we're going to see more of Mjolnir and Amos in the future. Um, but what do you think? Let me know what you think about this vehicle. Maybe you've used it before. Maybe you're part of the Swedish military. Uh, when I did go to BA Systems Haglunds, uh, there was some discussion about them using this vehicle and demonstrating it. I would love to have a go of this vehicle. I think it'd be fantastic, especially myself being an artillery gunner. It'd be a fantastic addition to my... Uh, you know, my portfolio of artillery pieces that I've been able to fire. Um, really, really cool. And, uh, you know, if, again, you have used it, please let me know what you think of it. I'm, I'm really curious to get first-hand experience from the user of these vehicles, what you thought. If you did enjoy today's video, folks, please leave me a like. And, of course, check out my description box below for uh, my Patreon and my PayPal. I want to thank everyone who's been uh, financially supporting my channel. It really does mean a lot. Of course, we also have my artillery clothing brand, Attire for Effect, that is the sponsor of this channel, and you can go check out their online store they got some really cool stuff finally if you want to see future videos of me click that little bell by the subscribe button and i hope to see you on the next video all the best everyone take care bye bye